to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. As we study more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and as we strive to bring His life and teaching into our life, nothing can help us more than to really know what the mind of Christ was and to instill those ideas in our everyday life. We welcome you today to our study. As always, this lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church who have a sincere love for lost souls. It, we encourage you in your local area, visit the Church of Christ. Let them know maybe you'd like to have a Bible study or learn more about the church. Let them know about that and they'd be happy to sit down and open up God's Word with you. At the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God in any way that we can. We make all of our CDs and video lessons, audio and video lessons available from our website. You can locate it at thegospelofchrist.com where we have a wide variety of study materials, great uh, library of information that you can look through as you study your Bible that would be a help to you in doing just that. And friend, we'd love to make, co make a copy of today's lesson available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy, just log on to our website or you can call or write to us and we'd be happy to send that to you. We'll even pay the postage to get it there. As we think about the mind of Christ, Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2 ought to stir within each of us a desire to really be more like Jesus. You know, that's what Christ wants. As you look to the teaching of the New Testament, the Bible encourages us to pattern our life and thinking after Christ, to be more like Him every day. This is why Peter would say we're to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 through 22. Paul himself strove to do just that, and he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I also imitate the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about this initial lesson, and especially as we think about Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, there's some background information that becomes very pertinent. For example, as Paul writes this message to the church in Philippi to have the mind of Christ, there were some serious things in that city and in that church that people were having to deal with. For example, Philippi itself was a city that was bent on making a profit rather than seeing the welfare of others. We know this because in Acts chapter 16, there is a woman who has an evil spirit. Paul cast that evil spirit out of her in Acts chapter 16 around verse 20. And instead of being thankful that this woman is now rid of that evil spirit, the people in Philippi are mad at Paul because he's cost them their profit. You see, she had a spirit of divination, an evil spirit no doubt, but it allowed her to have some way of telling things and they were making a profit off this woman who was entangled with wicked things and they got upset about that and so it was in some ways a, a very wicked city. There were some even in the church that were preaching the gospel out of selfish motives. Philippians chapter 1 verses 15 through 16, some preached Christ out of envy and strife, others were doing it for the right reasons. Some were doing it selfishly to bring persecution to the Apostle Paul. It was a church where selfishness brought about complaining and grumbling. Paul would have to later say, do all things without complaining and grumbling. So you've got a, a spirit of profiting in the city. You've got a spirit of selfishness in the congregation. As you read the letter to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 4, verses 2 through 3, there even seem to be two women who are so selfish that it's brought great contention between them. And so part of the reason Paul is saying this is out of selfishness 
on the part of other people. And friend, selfishness is always a huge problem. I'm not only to think about my own interest, but also the interest of others. Romans chapter 12 clearly teaches us that. We're not to be self-centered. We're to be focused on God and serving other people. Love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as ourself. And as Matthew 7 verse 12 teaches, in what we know is the golden rule, we're to strive to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And so let's think a little bit about the mind of Christ that is represented in Philippians 2 verse 5. Would you notice, notice with me in your Bible the very first verse, Philippians 2 verse 5. The writer says, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You've got people who need to be motivated out of selfishness to selflessly serve others in Christ. How do you do that? You've got to think about the mind of Christ. Jesus, that great physician who gave up so much so that others could be healed of the sickness and the disease of sin. Remember Mark 2, 17? Jesus said the, the righteous, they don't need to go. Those who are well don't need to go to a physician. But those who are sick, I came to call sinners to repentance. Why did Jesus come to this world? Listen carefully, my friend. If there is ever an example of selflessness, it's in Jesus. Was Jesus God? Absolutely. He is Lord and God. In John chapter 20 verse 28, He is the eternal God. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 through 10, He had a right to all things. He had a right for others to, uh, to, to, for other people to serve Him and yet He's the one who came and served according to Mark chapter 10 verse number 45. And so while we may never, as Jesus did, take upon ourselves the sin of the world, we're not asked to do that. Are we not to help others know about the gospel? and the seriousness of sin and to live a selfless life so that we can fully preach the gospel to others. You know, as we think about having the selfless mind of Christ and as we strive to live for Him every day, part of that selfless mind is, let's think about what good can we do for other people. Friend, there's no greater good, no more sacrificial good that can be done than what the Lord's already done. He made that ultimate sacrifice. He gave Himself for all men. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9 verse 22, that blood of bulls and goats under the Old Testament could never take away sin. But Jesus tasted death for every man. You know, if I'm really going to live a selfless life, I've got to stop thinking about myself and my own interest and my own desires. And I've got to ask myself, if Jesus came and lived this way, fully gave up everything for people to be saved, what does He expect of me? And friend, that's what He wants me to do. He wants me and He wants you to live a life of selflessness, a life that strives to glorify God in all that we say and do and teach the gospel to the lost so that they can know about the grace and the hope of Almighty God. Now, what are some things that, like Christ, made the ultimate sacrifice? What are some things that I'm told to sacrifice in this life? Think with me for just a moment about some of these things. First, I'm told to sacrifice myself. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, I am to live as a living sacrifice. You know that language is in such stark contrast to the Old Testament. What were the sacrifices under the Old Testament? Dead sacrifices. They gave up their life. And yet I'm to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Every day I live, life's not about me and my passions and my desires. If I'm going to have the selfless mind, the sacrificial mind of Jesus, I've got to live a life of true sacrifice of self. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul would say. I've got to take up my cross daily and live for Jesus. Galatians 2 verse 20 and Luke chapter 9 verse number 23. You know, along those same lines, I must sacrifice what talents and things and abilities I have to the Lord. Matthew 25, we all have different talents and abilities and things that, that we can use. You remember the parable of the talents? Each person had different abilities, talents. In the context, it was the money that was given them. But with what we have, we've got to use that to the glory of God. Whatever 
talent you have, whatever things that you excel at, whatever things that you may be really good at. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's, maybe it's building things. Maybe it's talking to people. Maybe it's encouraging others. Maybe it's helping the sick or feeding the poor. Whatever things I'm good at. Listen carefully now. I want to take those things. I want to sharpen them. I want to hone them. And I want to selflessly sacrifice them to the cause of Christ. To use it in a way that will build up God's kingdom, that will help save lost souls, and will ultimately edify those around us. You know, as we think about this idea, it was again the Lord and Savior who made this selfless sacrifice and who motivates us. Jesus said that He came to seek and save those who are lost. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Hebrews 7 verse 25, and if I'm really going to sacrifice, I've got to have the mindset of I want to do what I can to take the gospel to the lost. Sacrifice of self to spread that wonderful message of salvation, to go into all the world and, and preach the gospel. And friend, here's what makes this so practical to the selfishness that's going on in the book of Philippians. People are so enamored with their self. They're thinking, why do others have this and I don't? Why is this going on and I'm being left out? Maybe they've got all these different selfish ideas. If I'm concerned about Christ, and I'm concerned about preaching the gospel, and I'm concerned about using what I have to glorify the God in the kingdom, where's the time to sit around and sulk over what I do or don't have or what others have that's better than me? If I'll stay busy working in the kingdom, friend, those other ideas really pale in comparison when we think about this. Now, what does it mean to really have that selfless mind. I want you to look a little further. In Philippians chapter 2, I want you to look at verses 6 and 7 now. The Bible says, Of Christ, who had the selfless mind, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. By the term, gave up. He gave up. What does that mean? We do not mean that Jesus no longer had deity. We realize that Jesus was God when He came to this earth. He was still God, but He was willing to, as God, submit Himself under the authority of the Father. He was willing to give up so that we could have all the joy and hope that you find in the Bible. And so, what did Jesus give up? in coming to this earth. What must I empty myself of? Well, Jesus gave up being with the Father. He gave up that eternal identity and submitted to the Father's will. Uh, as you think about these ideas, how wonderful it is to know that in Genesis 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. John 1 verse 14, Jesus became flesh for us. Was He God? Absolutely. But did He take upon Himself the form of human flesh? And did He submit to the Father? Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 3, Restore to me that which we had from eternity. There was a separation. There was a giving up. There was a sacrifice made by deity on behalf of Christ and for us so that we could be saved. And so He gave up His eternal identity. He gave up emptying Himself, and He gave up His heavenly home. I want you to listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. When I think about what it means to give up and really empty myself, I think of what Jesus had to give up. Listen to these words. The Bible says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. You ever really stopped and thought about that verse? Though he was rich, Jesus was in heaven. Out of the ivory palace, as the psalmist said. And yet that's where Jesus was. Though he was rich, listen to the motive, yet for your sakes he became poor. It is said of the Lord and Savior, he didn't have a place to call his own. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He gave up. He didn't have the pleasures and amenities of this life that we think of. Why? For your sakes he became poor. What's the motive? That we, through his poverty might be made rich. You ever stop and thought about that Jesus left the very place I am striving every day to go so that I could one day, one day go and be there with Him? 
what sacrifice, what self-emptying that must have taken by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, along those same lines, just as Jesus emptied Himself, for us to really live a life of selflessness, you've got to be willing to empty yourself of certain things. Uh, allow me to illustrate. I've got to empty myself of any pride and arrogance. Pride cannot be a part of a selfless person's life. Of the things that God hates, one of those is pride. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. As you well know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride cannot be the factor that motivates us. You know, when we talk about pride, we're talking about me and mine and, and I. You hear all those personal pronouns. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about looking out for others' interests. Philippians 2, verses 2 through 3, not only concerned about our own interests, but the interest of others. It's about putting others before self. It's about making sacrifices so that others can have the hope and the joy that we have in this life. You know, in this life, we've got to be willing to empty ourselves of, of any type of status we might think we have. Paul had a lot to brag about, did he not? In Philippians chapter 3, Paul will say, I was chief of the tribes, I, I had the greatest training, a uh, zealot. He'll mention a whole list of things that he had. And you know what Paul says basically about that? All of that I count as rubbish for Christ. What's rubbish? Trash. Paul said, compared to what I've gained in Christ, what I thought I had is now trash. Friend, everything that I may, that we maybe put trust in or maybe want to fill ourselves up with really isn't that important concerning Christ. Uh, our financial status, what good's all that finance going to do on the final day? Can you say to God, well, you know, I really hadn't lived right, but I've got a bank account full of money. God doesn't care about that. What about, you know, being some highly educated person? Don't get me wrong. We're not saying money's wrong. We're not saying education's wrong. But if my existence revolves around how smart I am, how much good is that going to do if I'm not willing to submit to the will of God? Again, not saying those things are wrong, but I've got to be willing to empty myself and realize those things are not what's important. Most important in this life is submitting to Christ and following Him and letting God use me, whether it be social status, whether it be the job I have, whether it be the friends I've got, those things are not the things that we really want to emphasize in this life. I want to empty self so that I can truly follow Jesus and submit to Him in every way. And so selfishness is just something that God does not want His people to have. You know, sometimes selfishness gets in the way of really doing good. Uh, let me illustrate. Selfishness is what causes us not to really help those who are in need. What is pure religion? Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. What is it that keeps a person from going out and helping those who are in need? And there may be legitimate reasons. Maybe you can't help. I'm not talking about somebody who can. Selfishness. It's a big, big factor. Maybe I'm too selfish to not only help people in the world, but help the brethren. Galatians 6 verse 10 says, Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. And so I've got to have the mindset, I want to help not only the world, but I want to do good unto brethren. When somebody's sick in the congregation, when somebody loses a home or somebody's hurting, what keeps us from helping them? A lot of times it's selfishness. What keeps us from talking to our neighbor about the gospel? Selfishness, pride, arrogance, things that often get in the way that the Christian must empty if he's really going to serve Almighty God. Now, look again at Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse number 7. The Scripture says of Jesus, But He made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man. What will help me to overcome selfishness? Having a servant attitude. Jesus became a servant. He was God. He took upon Himself the form of a bondservant. A bondservant is a unique term. It's one who willingly sells himself into servitude to serve the Master, to live under His control, to be completely under Him. Friend, that's the idea. I want to fully 
give myself as a servant to God. Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul beautifully illustrated this. To me, he said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. A bondservant fully devotes himself to the master. That's the idea of there not being anything left about what we desire, living for self, but living every day to follow Jesus and His teaching. He's under the master's authority in every way. Whatever the master says, he's there for his beck and call. That's our mindset. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Matthew 28, verse 18, and we must submit to that authority and truly love the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in every way. Now, I want to show you something else from this text. Look in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 8, and part of having that selfless mind is found in our humility. Look in verse number 8. The Bible says of Jesus, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You know, when you think about humility, we're talking about one willingly, although they might not have to do that, although it's not something that would be part of their quality. They're willing to selfishly humble themselves, to place themselves under is the idea. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. When we think about the mind of Christ and how selfless that is, you remember the words of Jesus. Jesus said, do you not think that I can not call 10,000 legions of angels? You know, Jesus could have easily put a stop to the things on the cross, but that wasn't what He wanted to do. Jesus clearly said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father. The question is asked in Hebrews 10, who shall we send? Here am I is the idea, send me. He willingly came. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Obedience is always directly tied to having the mind, the selfless mind of Jesus. He was willing, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but yours be done. Matthew 26, verse 39 following. He even did that to the point of death. In agony, he's going through the garden, begging God, in essence, don't let these things happen, yet it's not what I want, but you want. And he submitted to the will of God, humbled himself as a servant, and took upon himself that sacrifice that was so important for him to make in so many ways. You know, as I think about living for Christ, as we really think about what it means to have the mind of Christ, a big part of that is humility. Are we really humble enough to focus more on Christ and place ourselves under what He wants us to do. Humility is a huge part of that. And friend, I will assure you, if we'll have the selfless mind of Christ, just as Jesus was exalted, so one day we can as well. Notice the words of Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. The Scripture records, Therefore God also has highly exalted Him, and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What did Jesus receive by having this selfless, sacrificial mindset of giving up to help others? God has highly exalted Him. And His name is the name that every knee bows and every tongue confesses. What's the idea there? Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself, he'll be humbled. Luke chapter 14, verse number 11. And so, to really exemplify this selfless mind, I want to have that humility. And it's that humility that allows us one day to hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. And so, friend, as we think about the mind of Christ. Here are the things that we really want to consider and really want to drive home. Is our life really being lived sacrificially? Let's ask it this way. Are we more concerned about what we're getting out of this life, how people think about us, and what joys we get to have, or are we more concerned about what Christ wants and how we can help others? What are we doing in this life to really honor Christ? That's what life's all about, is it not? Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we do good, when we try to help, what's it all about? Pointing the light to Jesus. Letting others see Him. You know, in this life, we want to do good unto all men. Galatians 6 verse 10. Are we trying to help those who are in need? Are we trying to help the poor? Are we trying to encourage those who are sick? Are we trying to lift up those who are downtrodden? Are we really serious about spreading the gospel to the lost? And are we doing all of that? to point the light on Jesus, to magnify Him in each and every way. That's the motive that God wants us to have in doing these things. And friend, in doing that, do we really possess that servant mindset? I've not been called here, nor have you been called into the kingdom to be a, one who's over, a, a lord over it, as we might say. I've been called to serve. In fact, the greatest servant was a lord. And he humbled himself. Do you remember Mark 10, verse 45? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Look at what Jesus did. He had every right to be served, and yet he came to serve. That's the mindset that Christians desperately need. Friend, if you've never submitted your will to the will of Christ, you can begin to possess that mind today by really being obedient to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whatever I am or have in this life, those things are really going to be not important, really going to be uh, very shallow when we view them in view of the judgment. One day all men will stand before the throne of God. All of us will have to give an account for the way we've lived in this life. The things that matter are what we do for God and how we live for others and live for Christ every day. And so are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Jesus clearly teaches us that to follow Him we must believe He is God's Son. Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins, Jesus said, John 8, 24. Would you be willing to change your life and turn to God in repentance? Acts 2, verse 38. Would you make that confession just as the Ethiopian eunuch did? I believe Jesus is the Christ, Acts 8, 36 and 37. And would you, to have your sins washed away, be immersed in water, Acts 22, 16. May each of us strive every day to have the selfless mind of Jesus and bring honor and glory to Almighty God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. With his pride, this is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.